Is it possible that in a twist of fate, African countries, once colonies of the West, would rise up and be the colonizers? We know colonization is bad, yes, but just think about it for a minute. What if instead of African countries receiving foreign aid every year, African countries are now the ones sending aid worth millions of dollars to Europe and the West? What if instead of Africa always looking to attract investment from foreign companies, which at the end of the day doesn't favor the country, it's now the West and Europe begging for investment from Africa? What if instead of Africans migrating en masse to Europe looking for better opportunities, Europeans are now the ones migrating in their numbers searching for better opportunities in African countries? Are these scenarios possible? Well, the fact is it is very much possible because African countries have all the human and material resources to achieve this. Angola, a country in Central Africa under the rule of its former president Jose Eduardo dos Santos, even though it was a corrupt regime, gave a glimpse of how an African country turned things around to become the savior of its former colonial master. For more than 400 years, Portugal exploited Angola often brutally as its colony, until the country gained independence in 1975, after a long struggle. However, the process of getting that independence was traumatic leading to a civil war that lasted until 2002, when the former president of Angola, José Eduardo dos Santos, who had been in power since 1979, finally defeated the UNITA rebel movement. As you can imagine, the country, though blessed with oil and diamonds, was struggling. The economy was bad and things were difficult, which isn't surprising given that the country had been ravaged by civil war since 1975. Meanwhile, Portugal, its former colonial master, had been growing steadily and healthily, converging with the more prosperous European Union economies. At the time, the Portugal government saw President José as a trustworthy ally who would protect the interests of Portugal in the country. Although the economy was bad, money still circulated among the Angolan elites. And just like how some African politicians love to acquire properties and spend their fortunes in Paris or London, Lisbon, the capital of Portugal became the choice location for real estate acquisition and capital flight for the Angolan elites. Portuguese lawyers, bankers, and accountants became the trusted stewards of the growing fortunes of the Angolan elites. They secretly took up Portuguese passports and sent their children to the best schools in Lisbon. However, everything changed after José defeated the rebels and oil price increased. Soon enough, Angola doubled oil production, and with the increase in the price of oil, the GDP of the country increased by tenfold, bringing in tremendous wealth for the country. Energized by this extraordinary wealth, which made Angola one of the fastest growing economies in the world, and the third in Africa, the regime of President Dos Santos sought to remake the country and reinvent its status in the world. Interestingly, at the same time, things turned around for Angola. Its former colonial master was in poor shape. The economy of Portugal was tanked, and the Eurozone turmoil led Lisbon into debt, recession, and the arms of international lenders. In 2011, Portugal was on the verge of bankruptcy and had to receive a $100 billion bailout from the European Union and the International Monetary Fund, IMF. But as you know, any country that borrows from the IMF is usually worse off than before they borrowed, because loans from the IMF usually come with a condition which most of the time does not favor the country. So in exchange for the loans, Portugal had to agree to some radical austerity measures, which left its population poorer and sapped the welfare state. So in a curious twist of fate, Portugal was in bad shape while its former colony, Angola, was awash with oil money, enjoying a growth rate of 5 to 15 percent. What do you think the Angola government, which Portugal felt was an ally, did? Portugal needed help, and guess who it turned to? Angola, its former colony that it brutally exploited, and Angola answered the call for help. Angola began to invest heavily in Portugal, commanding substantial stakes in the Portugal economy from the banking sector and telecommunications to the media and energy. The president's daughter, Isabel dos Santos, who was once the richest woman in Africa, was at the forefront of this movement. In March 2015, the president's daughter unveiled plans for a merger between two major banks, Millennium BCP and Banco BPI, which would create a new financial giant in Portugal. This deal highlights the influence of Angolan capital in the Portuguese economy, which is still struggling to recover from the Eurozone debt crisis. During this period, Angola pumped so much money into Portugal that it became the only country in Africa where outward investment exceeded foreign investment in the country. According to the Bank of Portugal, 
Angolan investments in Portugal rose from 645 million euros to 1.53 billion euros between 2010 to 2014. Imagine how the situation has reversed. An African country is now the one helping and investing in a European country. According to a French historian, Angola has gained the upper hand and is now looking for recognition, making it very clear where the money is coming from, sometimes to the point of humiliation. In February 2014, when Portugal raised the possibility of selling 85 Moreau paintings in order to raise money, an Angolan millionaire, Rui Costa Reis, offered to buy them. Angolans became the leading buyers of prestige real estate, such as the apartment in Cascais, acquired old money port wine estates, and kept crisis-hit luxury restaurants and retail shops afloat. But it wasn't only the elites in Angola doing the spending and investing. The emerging Angola middle class turned the capital of Portugal, Lisbon, into its playground. They spent so much money that it drew the envy and decision of local Portuguese. One Portuguese, Vasco Lorenzo, once said that maybe Angola will colonize us now. As Angolans were flocking to Portugal buying up their properties, tens of thousands of Portuguese citizens headed to the south of Angola, seeking an escape from austerity and unemployment in Angola's oil-fueled boom. The migrants from Portugal provide Angola with workers for highly skilled sectors like construction, marketing, and education. In 2013, Portuguese workers living in Angola sent over 304 million euros back to their cash-starved homeland. However, even though the presence of these migrants in Angola was lucrative in terms of remittances sent to Portugal, it was often perceived as a further instance of Portuguese exposure to Angolan whims, and not as a sign of mutual cooperation between both countries. Angola's power quickly grew beyond acquiring assets to include snatching up parts of the Portuguese elite, which runs a backdoor between the public and private spheres. It's even believed that Angolan influence spread so much in Portugal that it reached the very center of the Portuguese political system through large-scale financing of political parties. Portugal did not object to any of this. Instead, they argued that the economy was cash-strapped, Portuguese corporations undercapitalized, and Angola, with its endless liquidity, was a lifeline. Angola pumped so much money into Portugal, so much so, that when Angola threatened to cut off ties in recent years, in response to reports that Angolan officials were being investigated for corruption in Portugal, Portugal's foreign minister immediately apologized, setting off an intercontinental debate about the changing power dynamics between the nations. No doubt the Angolan elites were corrupt. The oil boom only benefited the elites and a few of the middle class. However, the idea that an African country was not in the begging position but is now the one doing the threats is mind-blowing. According to a Portuguese journalist and author of the book, The Angolan Power in Portugal, Celso Felipe, we had it in our heads that Angola was a poor country that needed to be helped. But suddenly, they were able to help us and to buy things that we cannot buy. It was like a housekeeper buying your house. That is awkward, he said. Now, why was Angola so interested in Portugal? Why invest so much? The government of Angola could have refused to help Portugal in its time of crisis. Well, Angola simply saw an opportunity and took it like any Western country would have done. The economic crisis in Portugal made it easy for Angolans to easily own large Portuguese corporations that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to afford. Portugal also had the potential to mainstream the interests of Angolans away from their questionable origins and into the heart of the global economy. But aside from this reason, there was a deeper motive. Some of the investments made were not even profitable. Some Angolans even lost money in the process. So why take the risk? Well, according to experts, Angolans had a post-colonial score to settle. It was a form of revenge over the 400 years of brutal colonization by the Portuguese. Owning chunks of the Portuguese economy a generation after the end of colonialism was itself a mobilizing factor for wealthy Angolans, even if they lost money in the process. Investing in the media and banking brings Luanda greater influence. The Portuguese are unhappy about this situation, even bitter at times, but who would dare criticize? However, things changed again in 2014 when oil prices began to drop, and with its revenue halved, the president of Angola had to put on hold its ambitious infrastructure projects, leading to an unprecedented degree of social protest. This situation also affected Portugal because Angola had to reduce its investment, thereby leading to a reduction in Angola's influence across Portugal. Currently, 
President Dos Santos is no longer the president of Angola, having been replaced by President Lorenzo, who has cracked down on the Dos Santos family and elites in Angola for corruption. Portugal's economy is also reviving, leading to a kind of balance between both countries. Now, we are not in any way applauding or supporting the corruption in Angola. But the point is, the situation between Angola and Portugal highlights the fact that African countries have the potential to turn around from what they currently are as poor countries always begging for aid from the West to countries that are so wealthy, they are now the source of foreign investments for the West. And this can be achieved with strong patriotic leaders who are ready to bring this vision to reality. Hopefully, this set of new African leaders will be able to bring this vision to reality.